Church meets every Sunday morning at 9 o'clock for Bible study, 10 o'clock for morning worship, 6 o'clock Sunday evening, 7 on Wednesdays for our midweek Bible study. We do have our sermons broadcast live every Sunday morning, 1060 a.m., which is WKNG AM radio. We also have all of our sermons broadcast live on our website. So if you have the occasion to be at home and not able to be here, or if you have folks that are shut in or family that you wish to include in the uh, worship services as they're broadcast live, we would encourage you to do that also, bremencfc.org. Brother Martin Higley will lead our song service this morning. He selected number 508. 508 is our first song. If you wish to turn to that or watch the screen above me at the appropriate time. Brother Jimmy Adams will lead our minds in prayer. Brother Joel Pitsley will conclude our service in prayer this morning. And our message this morning will be brought to us by Brother John McDaniel. Chad and his family are out of town this week, but we're looking forward to Brother McDaniel's lesson. Several on our prayer list that I wish to bring to your attention. Joan Thurman is not feeling well and is not able to be with us here today. You're also asked to remember Jackie Tomlin. This is Kyle's mother and Jim and Elisa's daughter-in-law. She's seeing an ophthalmologist this morning in Atlanta for a possible detached retina. So certainly our prayers requested on behalf of Jackie Tomlin and her family. Frida Gray continues in room 404 at Tanner in Carrollton. We do know that she is scheduled for a hip replacement surgery this week, February the 5th. So I'm sure she's looking forward to that and getting that over and behind her. C.J. Clackham, the father of Mary Blank, had a stent put in this past week, last Tuesday. Her mother, Joyce Lambert, still scheduled to have cataract surgery February 2nd, correct? February 2nd. Renee Melson, this is Tammy's first cousin is being treated for melanoma of the eye. She does request our present, our prayer. We also express our sympathy to uh, Phyllis Glover in the passing of her cousin, Kenneth Rogers. The um, service was last week in Waco. <coughs> Jesse Wilson, who is a classmate of Connor Madison and Ashland, also requests our prayer. Her mother passed away this past week. You're also asked to remember Kaylee Wilkerson. This is the eight-year-old cousin of Elizabeth Reed. Elizabeth tells me that she has a brain tumor. Or any others that we should mention at this time. Activities I wish to bring to your attention. The ladies' Devo and Potluck lunch will be this coming Thursday, February the 5th, 11 a.m. here at the building. <coughs> Group four, Chad Reagan's group will meet uh, two weeks from today, February 15, after the evening service in the Fellowship Hall. Group two, Gary and Jamie's group will meet Saturday, February 21st in the Fellowship Hall, 5 p.m. Children's Home Food Truck will be here March the 2nd. Consult your bulletin or the bulletin board here in the hallway for items that they have need for. The Yes Weekend is also quickly approaching. Believe it or not, it's already February the 1st. That Yes Weekend is three weeks, basically three weeks. Uh, starts on Friday, Saturday, and then concludes on Sunday the 22nd. Sign the list on the bulletin board. If you plan to attend, please do that as soon as possible. When are they? By today? By today. If you're going, sign the list by today. The cost is $50 per person, sixth grade and up for Yes Weekend in Valdosta. The list is on the bulletin board here in the hallway. The Bowden Congregation has their winter lectureship this next weekend, beginning February 6th through 8th, topic preaching Jesus, and the speakers are also listed on the bulletin board here in the hallway. And again, it's also time to begin thinking about reorganizing our Brothers Keepers groups. It seems like we just did that. But here it is again. That will begin uh, the uh, 1st of March. So if you have the interest in being a Brothers Keepers group leader, or if you want to continue to be, please let that be known to Gary and Jamie at your earliest opportunity. Would you bow with me, please? Father, we're thankful that you've spared our lives to this hour. We're thankful that we have the measure of health that allows us to be here for the opportunity to meet with those of like precious faith in this place today. Father, we're thankful for every blessing that you shower upon us, and may we not take it for granted. May we know and keep in the forefront of our minds from whence they come. Father, we're mindful of those that are away from us for whatever reason, those that are traveling, those that are infirm, those that are shut in. 
those that are not here but could have been. Father, continue to watch over and care for them and help us to seek opportunity to do same. <clears throat> Father, we're thankful for those who have a public part in our worship this morning, for those in their willingness to do so, and for their abilities, and they express their talents to us this morning. Brother Martin, as he leads our song service, Brother Johnny, as he breaks unto us the bread of life, the men that serve the memorial feast to us, and those that lead public prayers. Father, we're thankful for their willingness to do this. But Father, most importantly, we're thankful for this opportunity to worship thee in spirit and in truth, and we pray fervently that we will do just that. You'll be pleased with our efforts, and we can edify one another. Father, we're thankful for this congregation here at Bremen, for its longstanding history and stand for the truth. May it ever be the glorious church, unspotted for the world, that you would have it be. We're thankful for each member that makes it up. Father, continue to watch over and care for us. Forgive us when we fail thee. May you always strive to do what's right. For this is our humble prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. May we continue our worship now and stand and sing number 508. Lord's Supper turn to number 265. 265.
Let us pray. Dear Father, we are so thankful for your many blessings. We are thankful for your blessing of Jesus Christ who died on that cruel cross so we might have life everlasting. Dear Father, please bless this bread which to the Christian represents his body. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Did we overlook anyone? Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we're mindful of that sacrifice that you gave for us on that day, we do know that it came at the cost of your own son. And Father, we're thankful that he was willing to shed his blood so that we can have life and forgiveness of sin through our obedience. Father, we pray that you'll bless this cup which, bless, which represents the blood of the new covenant that was shed for many. Jesus' name, amen. Did we overlook anyone that's serving the fruit of the vine? This concludes the Lord's Supper. 
Let us pray. Dear Father, we're so thankful for all the many blessings that you give us. We're so thankful for all the material things that we have. Dear Father, help us to give back a portion of our means and help us to be a cheerful giver. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Number 446, <clears throat> 446. I care not today what the morrow may bring, if shadow or sunshine or rain. The Lord I know ruleth for everything, and all of my worry is vain. Living my faith in Jesus above, trusting confide. May blow and the storm clouds arise. Four hundred sixty-one. We're saying this before our prayer. Four hundred sixty-one. 
461. I need the prayers of those who love me. I need the prayers of those who care. I need the help of every Christian to take God's message everywhere. He answers prayers for all the faithful. He Father, we're so blessed to be at this meeting place today. We're so thankful for each one who's assembled here. Father, we're so thankful to be with brothers and sisters as we consider thy word this day, as we lift up these songs of praise before thee, as we have assembled around this table to remember thy son's death on our behalf. Father, we're truly a blessed people. Father, we pray we have prepared ourselves to be here today that we will Consider the things that will be spoken about as Johnny comes and leads us in a study of thy word. We pray if we've prepared our hearts and minds to receive these things, that we might place them within our hearts and minds and live them out in our lives each day, that we don't share them with those round about us. Father, we had many today who are not here that due to health reasons, we pray, Father, that you would send the blessings they stand in need of, that would make them whole if it be thy will and thy servants, Father, that we would be good servants, we would tend to their needs as we have opportunity. Father, we're mindful of those who are gone traveling this week, that you would be with them, that you'd give the safety of travel, that would return to us. Father, we pray that you would continue with us through the rest of this worship, that we'd do things in accordance to thy word, that it may be done in spirit and in truth, and you'd be pleased with our efforts this day. And Father, if we fail thee in these things, we pray that you'd forgive us, for this is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. With Mark number 71, we're saying this after the lesson this morning is the imitation hymn. 71. Which stand in turn number 605. We're saying this for the lesson. 605. <clears throat> I walk with a king.
crowd assembled this morning thankful for your presence here and I am grateful for the opportunity to share with you some uh, thoughts from God's Word here in the next few minutes uh, let's get a PowerPoint queued up here there's a football game tonight some of y'all may have heard something about that uh, those of us in the south East in the state of Georgia don't really have a dog in that fight unless you have some connection to those teams. Uh, didn't quite get there this year, but uh, so I have heard a lot of people will be watching the Super Bowl this evening, and a lot of people that aren't even fans of football will watch the Super Bowl for what? A commercial, that's right. So uh, we will certainly be uh, uh, able to avail ourselves of lots of that during the Super Bowl if you watch it. Uh, even if you record it and watch it later, you can skip those. But uh, it's interesting. Advertising has always fascinated me uh, from a young age, and probably because I watched way too much of WTCG Channel 17, uh, which eventually became TBS. Some of you may remember that. Gilligan's Island, 24 hours a day uh, as a kid. But uh, the messages that come with advertising uh, can be very helpful, can be very informative, but sometimes they can be very deceptive. This morning I want us to think about uh, false advertising, spiritual false advertising. We're going to tie that in with uh, some of these uh, illustrations as well. Some of you may remember this, super elastic bubble plastic. Does anybody remember super elastic bubble plastic? Any one, one, Gary, thank you. At least one of us out there, a uh, couple, couple remember this. I remember in, uh, growing up in the 70s and 80s, super elastic bubble plastic. And this is one of those things that when I saw it on the TV and I saw all the fun that those kids were having playing with those bubbles, wandering through green meadows and frolicking about, uh, I had to have some. Just had to have some super elastic bubble plastic by Whammo, who made other great products throughout history as well uh, that have served mankind. But I, I had to have some, so I got uh, some super elastic bubble plastic through some probably goading my parents or, or saving my allowance, and I brought it home, and uh, it didn't work quite the way they showed on the commercial. Because as you see, uh, uh, the, the huge balloon that the, the little young lady in the middle uh, illustration there is blowing, uh, it didn't quite work that way. You take a, a, a viscous substance squeezed out of a tube, put it on the end of a straw, and you're supposed to end up with this big, durable beach ball-like thing. It didn't, and it just didn't work that way. I was very disappointed. Uh, super elastic bubble plastic was the name brand of a children's toy manufactured through the 1970s by Whammo, consisted of a tube of viscous plastic substance, a thin straw blown semi-solid bubbles. Well, there was, part of the story was there, but the, all the truth wasn't there. There was some things they didn't tell us about super elastic bubble plastic. I'll, I'll read uh, from the most uh, accurate source of information on the internet that's uh, very well documented, Wikipedia, which says, besides the potential for spills, when liquid plastic was handled by children, duh, uh, the substance also emitted noxious fumes. 
The fumes could be concentrated inside the straw, making it dangerous to inhale through the straw when inflating a bubble. Toy was not recommended for children under five, and because of these problems, super elastic bubble plastic was eventually discontinued. Well, if I had known all of those things uh, before I spent my money on it, uh, maybe I would have made a better decision. And that's sort of a uh, comical, although true, illustration of what I want us to concentrate on this morning, talking about this idea of false advertising. You saw on the uh, slide before that a, a reference was made to Genesis 3. We're going to spend some time there in just a moment. But I would also say that this is a lesson that is important and, and necessary and useful uh, for me and for everyone here. But I would also go further to say that when I, when I was coming up with thoughts, I really had in mind for those of our crowd who are younger. Uh, because there's so many decisions that we can make in our formative years, in our adolescence, our, our early 20s, that can affect us for the rest of our lives in, in, in positive or negative ways. And I think in those younger years, we're maybe more susceptible to messages that don't give us the whole truth because we haven't had the experience and the wisdom and the learning that comes along uh, with, with being older and having experienced these things. I know that I've had some situations like that in my own, uh, in my own formative years when I learned a lesson uh, that I might have made a bad decision and, and learned a lesson from that and made better decisions uh, as I went on future, in, in the future. But a good lesson for all of us, especially for our, 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 our young folks. So with that in mind, uh, turn with me to Genesis chapter 3. And a very familiar story, uh, certainly no uh, new information here, but really the, the first false message that was ever given. Uh, now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he, the serpent, said to the woman, Eve, has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Now Eve does a good job here. Eve has learned a lesson. She's been told by God what the truth is. And she recounts that knowledge. And she says... Uh, we may eat of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. And here, in the very first ever false advertisement, the first half-truth, the first lie ever told, the Satan says to Eve, you shall not surely die. You shall not surely die. Well, that was not the full story, was it? And we know from the history of the Bible and from the necessity of sending uh, the Son of God to earth to make up for the sins of man that started here in this very situation, we know that that was not the whole truth. But what is it about sin that, that draws us in? What is it that uh, makes it something that's appealing to the human to partake in? Well, we could tie that to, in many cases, the pleasure of sin. You know, nobody has ever said that sin was not pleasurable. If it weren't, then we would not be tempted to partake in it. Uh, Moses knew this, and in Hebrews 11:24, the Bible says, By faith Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy what? The passing pleasure of sin. So in the context of what we're talking about right now, the Bible recognizes, God recognizes that sin can be pleasurable. And again, if, it, if, it, if there weren't any pleasurable aspect, if there weren't something that we, uh, can, can be gained by partaking in certain sins, then why would we be tempted to do them? But we have to remember we're not getting the whole story. This is also seen uh, in the parable of the sower. Luke 18, verse 14, Jesus has offered this parable, told about the different uh, types of ground that can be seeded with the word of God. And then later in, in the chapter, he explains that back. And in that explanation, Jesus says, Now the ones, the seeds that fell among thorns, are those who when they have heard go out and are choked with what? With cares and riches and the pleasures of life and bring no fruit to maturity. So misplaced pleasure is pleasure, 
but it can choke out the seed of the word of God. So nobody said that sin isn't pleasurable. We can put that out there right away and understand it and admit it, right? Uh, there are pleasures to be gained, to be had with sin. However, we must always remember that we're not getting the whole story. And God has given us lawful ways to deal with our desires. God created us to have certain appetites and desires, and he's given us lawful ways to deal with them. For instance, with regard to physical intimacy, one of the sins that trips up so many in so many ways in this world, uh, God has given us uh, the information in Hebrews 13.4 where he says the married, that marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled. Marriage is honorable above all and the bed undefiled. God gave us uh, the need for physical intimacy. He also gave us the context in which that can be realized within the, 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 the confines of his law. And it's marriage. The marriage between a man and a woman who are married to each other. Uh, that's when we can uh, partake in this pleasure that God has given us. Uh, outside of that, it doesn't fit within God's law, and it's sin. The Bible is very plain there. So that's an, uh, that is an example of how God gives us a lawful way to deal with our desire. He, 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 he made us where we need to eat every day, right? Uh, but he also uh, helps us understand that gluttony is a sin. Uh, he's given us these things to sustain ourselves, some of them uh, for the mere pleasure of his people. But he also gives us, as we said, lawful ways to, to, to deal with those. However, Satan offers shortcuts. Satan offers shortcuts. He doesn't tell us the whole story. Uh, Satan uh, knows that sometimes we don't feel so good. So he offers us ways that we can feel good when really we, we feel bad. Uh, and, and you may know right away what I'm talking about here with drugs, alcohol, other substances. And these days, and lately, and I, I, we all see this, it's abuse of these things. And it doesn't have to be something illegal that you buy on the street in the clandestine uh, uh, connection. So many people are abusing legal substances, prescription medications, alcohol, and yes, that might make you feel better at first, but as we know, we don't have the whole story. It can lead to our destruction. Satan offers that shortcut. Satan offers the shortcut of how to make ourselves feel bigger or more important, perhaps, maybe raising our own self-esteem by uh, hurting others with our words, saying things that are doing things that might make others look smaller. And we, we, we understand the concept of cutting something down. And when we as Christians do that, and so many of us have, we don't, we don't elevate ourselves. We bring ourselves lower. We put ourselves uh, in the ditch where Satan wants us to be. And that's a shortcut that we try to employ to make ourselves feel bigger. Uh, and again, to our young people, how many, do we rem how many of us remember when we were young and, and we were just thinking, boy, if I was just a few years older, I could do what my brother and sister do, or I, could, I, could, I, I want to be mature, I want to get out there and, and, and ex explore the world and understand what's out there. And sometimes Satan offers us ways that we can do that, and we think they're going to make us look older and more mature, uh, but really they, they bring us lower. And then finally, uh, what about how to feel loved? Uh, how sad it is that uh, this, in so many cases, uh, causes us to, to go in the wrong direction. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't back up one point and mention this, the, 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 the point about feeling older and more mature causes our young people in many cases to experiment with things like tobacco products, including cigarettes, alcohol, bad language. Uh, we might think, it, yeah, you know, if I say that thing, maybe somebody will think I'm tougher, bigger, stronger, uh, older, uh, and, and also pornography, and which leads us to the next one. How to feel loved. Isn't it sad when we see uh, 
primarily maybe this might manifest itself in the lives of a young lady who has uh, had a situation where she doesn't feel as valued as she should. She, she doesn't have someone to help her understand uh, that, that Jesus loves you, that you have value just because you're a person and God created you in his image. And there's nobody to show that kind of love to a young lady who then turns to a false kind of love that will be shown to her uh, by someone uh, that doesn't have her best interests in mind. We see that time and time again, and that's very sad. Of course, that can happen in the lives of young men as well. So this is a shortcut that Satan offers, uh, and we so often see how it turns into something that God did not intend. Satan offers these shortcuts. They fulfill a need, perhaps in the short term, but it's outside of God's plan. False advertising does not give us the whole story. Let's break this up a little farther uh, and, and understand what the Bible has to say about it. First of all, Satan, his, his goal is not to help us. It may appear that he is, but he seeks to deceive us. In 1 Peter 5, 8, uh, we know that the Bible says for us to be sober, to be vigilant, vigilant, because our adversary, our enemy, that person who is against us, the entity that's against us, uh, walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. This is, this is Peter's description of Satan and how he works uh, for our destruction. And, and he tells us to, to watch out. Be on your guard. Uh, heed this warning because Satan is out there. And he is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. A couple points there. He's like a roaring lion, but he doesn't, he doesn't announce himself. Uh, we don't hear the roar. And a lion doesn't announce itself either. What does it do? It hides in the brush, uh, camouflaged because of its color and the golden weeds, and then when that unsuspecting animal comes by, it pounces. Uh, we may be drawn into a situation thinking we're very safe and that we're going to get benefit out of it, but Satan, like a roaring lion, will, will seek, point number two, whom he may devour. He doesn't go after the strongest among us. And when he does go after us, even if we do have strength, he's going to try to penetrate our lives where he sees a weakness. He seeks whom he may devour, and he finds the opportunities to do that. Satan seeks to deceive us as well, as we've already mentioned, as a crafty serpent. Uh, 2 Corinthians 11, 1 through 5 says, Oh, that you would bear with me a little folly. And indeed you do bear with me. Paul writing says here, For I uh, am jealous for you with godly jealousy. For I have betrothed you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he who comes preaches, to, preaches another Jesus whom you have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. Now in context here, Paul is talking about false teaching. He's talking about a false message coming, one that's not true to God's word. But he, he uses the example of, of Eve being deceived by the craftiness of the devil. Same principle applies. And the longer we turn our ear to that message, we may well end up putting up with that and, t and taking part in it ourselves. Um, Satan seeks to deceive us. Satan's goal is our eternal damnation. Turn with me to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. Uh, uh, perhaps one of the most useful descriptions of the process that takes place, and it is a process that takes place when we succumb to the temptations of the devil and we uh, allow ourselves to sin. James chapter 1, beginning in verse 13. James writes, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then... When desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. This is the process that Satan wants to take us through. Uh, we know that 
that we have desires, internal desires. God knows that. He knows those exist within us. But we have the choice and the responsibility to control them. But Satan also knows this, and he comes and he puts things out in front of us that will get our attention. And, and we talked about this in the youth class, and sometimes I equate this to uh, I, I like to fish. I don't do as much of it as I used to, but I do like to fish. And you, many times you'll have these fishing lures, and the single most uh, attractive aspect of the thing is that it's shiny. And it's going through the water, and if the light hits off of it right, the, that'll flash, and you know what? It'll get the attention of the fish. And fish are very curious, and they're also very hungry. Uh, and so we are like fish swimming along in our lives, and Satan puts this shiny thing in front of us that we think looks good. And we're drawn away, and we're enticed. And then the process goes on further that uh, the fish says, you know what? Not only do I think that looks interesting, but I'm going to pursue it. And I'm going to get a little closer, and then I'm going to take a bite. And then you find himself, you know, hauled to the surface and thrown in the boat. And that's exactly the same process that we can allow ourselves to go through with sin when we see something, and we, having the useful knowledge of the Word of God, many times we know when something's right and when something's wrong. We don't have any trouble discerning that, but the more we turn our attention to and begin to follow that, uh, the easier it becomes to, to take that bite, just like Eve did in the garden. Also, this is talked about in Romans 1, uh, beginning in verse 18 and through verse 20, it says, uh, this is how Satan takes advantage of, of God's nature. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may, may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. But although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and, foolish, uh, and their foolish hearts were darkened. So Paul here in the, in the beginning of the, the great book of Romans is talking about sort of the history of mankind and its relationship with God. And he says that, that God has revealed himself, his character to us from the very beginning. Part of that character is that God cannot lie. And God has said the wages of sin is death. And Satan knows this. So he wants to draw us into this because he knows that God will be faithful to his word. That if we, if we allow ourselves to be, uh, to be taken in sin and remain there, that God will have his judgment and that our, our souls will be lost eternally. So Satan takes advantage of God's uh, own goodness against us. And if we allow him, uh, we, we will have the futile thinking uh, that is mentioned here. We will not have an excuse, uh, as it says in verse 20. Uh, and even though we know God and his nature, our thoughts become futile and our hearts become darkened. And the, the process that Satan uses, as we have discussed this morning, is the telling of half truths. Back in Genesis 3, verse 4, you will not surely die. Well, was it the truth that Eve would not immediately at that point die a physical death? Yes, and that's what Satan used, that half-truth. However, she did subject herself to eventual physical death, and she subjected herself especially to eternal uh, damnation. Half-truth. Sin is pleasurable. Satan wants us to know that. We've already discussed that. But you know what? It's only pleasurable for a little while only pleasurable for a little while. There are, and we're going we're gonna to develop this point a little further before we're done, there are consequences to our actions. There are consequences. And uh, remaining in sin has consequences. Uh, depending on the different types of sin, uh, those consequences will be different, but they're always there. And then Satan wants us to think that we deserve what sin offers us. We deserve what sin offers us. You, you, have, you, you've, you know, you've had a hard day. You deserve uh, to do this or that. You know, uh, that person 
uh, didn't treat you right. You know, you deserve to take revenge yourself rather than letting God's uh, goodness and justice take place. Uh, you deserve to feel better. You deserve to have that. You should take it. Satan wants us to, to believe this, uh, but we'll also deserve the consequences that we will experience if we listen to those types of messages from Satan. So all of this leads us to uh, the reality of sin. And I heard, um, listened to an, another, another lesson recently along this topic, and, and these four points I really resonated with me and I think have good meaning for us uh, and, and, and the, some of the things we've discussed already. Number one, sin will pull you in. Just like we just read in James that we're drawn away and enticed. And Satan sets the hook and literally pulls us in. Sin will take you farther than you want to go. Now maybe my intent was just sort of to edge up to the, uh, the end of the cliff here and look over and just see what it was like. But sin will not allow us, if we, if we uh, abide in it, will not allow us to stop there. Eventually it's going to push us over the edge. It will take us farther than we want to go. It will keep us longer than we want to stay. And then finally, talking about consequences, sin will cost us more than we want to pay. I thought that those four points were a really good description of what living in uh, contrary to God's word and to doing the things that he does not want us to do uh, and neglecting the things he does want us to do will cost us. A um, couple of further points here. Some of you may recognize these pictures, and that's Lucy Pevensey and the story, um, the, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, the Chronicles of Narnia. And if you remember this particular scene, uh, the Pevensey children were, were staying outside in the country, outside of London during World War II when the Germans were bombing for their own safety. They were sent away to live with people they didn't know. And they find their way into the magic wardrobe that leads them into the land of Narnia, and Lucy is the one that finds that. And she encounters this character, Mr. Tumnus, who basically entices her back to his house. And there uh, they sit by a warm fire and she drinks uh, tea that uh, basically has something in it to make her very sleepy. And then Mr. Tumnus plays the interesting music uh, on the harp. Uh, and this episode that she was drawn into uh, she stayed a whole lot longer than she wanted to, and it almost cost her in the story uh, being captured by the evil queen, which very much represents sin in this story written by C.S. Lewis, who very much religious undertones of the story. Uh, we know that later on her brother uh, Edmund, I think was his name, uh, gave in to his uh, temptations and actually was captured. And because that happened, uh, Aslan, the lion in the story, uh, had to, to offer himself as a sacrifice. So what an interesting v vision of exactly what the Bible talks about. And that's, there wasn't a mistake by C.S. Lewis, a very, very good writer uh, who, who put this in a, a context that we can understand and relate to. But if we allow it to, uh, sin will pull us in and it will reign in our body. Romans 6, 12 to 14 says, Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey its lusts. Sin will take precedence in our bodies if we allow it to. And then in Romans 6, 16, Paul writes, Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slave whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? So the question is, who, who are we going to follow? What are we going to follow? Are we going to follow what God wants us to do, or are we going to allow sin to reign in our body and enslave us? And, and yeah, we're talking in very, very general terms about these things, but when you start thinking about uh, the types of, of sin that can enslave us and the consequences that it can have, we sort of understand the seriousness of all this, and you understand the reason why I say I, I, I hope that our young people are listening, because these decisions that you make uh, might be 
seem very minor at first, but the farther we walk into those things, the more than the longer they can affect us in our lives. And the consequences of sin include the fact that the, the, the sin in, in the life of the sinner affects that person, but it also affects a lot of other things and a lot of people. And it will affect those who love and care for you. Um, David was certainly a, uh, an example of this. We know the story of David, how he was uh, anointed at a young age to become the king. He, he slew the giant Goliath. Uh, he rose to a great position of power uh, with God's help. And then when he got comfortable in that, he committed a heinous act uh, of adultery and fornication and murder uh, in, the, in the case of Bathsheba. And David's life was never the same after that. The consequences of that decision followed him for the rest of his life. Now let me step aside and say this. David was penitent. And you can read that in the Psalms. He, he, when he was confronted with this sin by Nathan, you are the man, he recognized and uh, he wept bitterly in his soul, offered up Psalms to God of, of, of repentance and was able to obtain forgiveness. But forgiveness and consequences are different. And unfortunately, the consequences that can follow us through life, even after we're forgiven of sin, God cannot take those away. He will not take those away because he set the world in motion, made us free to make our choices, and the consequences are what they are. And we can never change certain things. We can be forgiven of them, and that's, that's a wonderful blessing. But, and, and, and we should do our best to forget those things that we're guilty of. God wants us to forget them. But it is a truth that consequences can remain, and that was certainly the case with David. And if you read uh, 2 Samuel chapter 12, you'll see that his family was, was, was relegated to live by the sword, uh, that his how own household would rebel against him, his son Absalom. Uh, in, in 2 Samuel 18, 33, if you read, in a war against his own father, Absalom is killed, and David says, O oh, Absalom, O oh, Absalom, if I could only have died in your place the sadness that existed, all as a result of consequences that remained after David's sin. Also, the, the, sin, the prodigal son. And yes, this story is a story of so many things. It's a story, I believe, primarily of forgiveness. Uh, the beautiful picture we see of, of the father running to his wayward son and, and the, the penitence that this young man feels. But... He had to hit bottom in this, in this case to go back up, to come to himself and go back to his father. This child of a very wealthy man who got his inheritance, squandered it, found himself in a pig pen. And I would say to all of us, and again, especially our young people, that the, the consequences of a life lived in such a hard way with uh, those kinds of abuses uh, can be devastating. And we see people who die at a young age because of uh, abuses of controlled substances uh, and, and not only those types, but abusing and going outside of God's plan uh, for sexual intimacy. You can never, you can never get, get those things back. Once they're, you're given away, they're gone. And the psychological problems that can exist and we've heard story after story of young women who have abortions and how that haunts them throughout the rest of their life. The consequences, unfortunately, remain. It's all the more motivation for us to make those good decisions while we're young and live the way God wants us to. Sin affects the lives of people we don't even know sometimes. Imagine uh, if you... Uh, imagine how someone who is a drunk driver and kills somebody uh, because of that sin feels and the, 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 the shock waves through the lives of others that exist because of one person's rebellion. But finally, sin is against God. David himself said, Against you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. Psalm 51.4, specifically talking about the sin uh, with Bathsheba and killing her husband, Uriah. So consequences remain, and we need to remember that uh, as we make decisions in our lives. But thankfully... 
There is a remedy for sin. Jesus, because of our sin, came to take our place. We know that God said the wages of sin is death. That is a consequence. A death has to take place. Jesus was willing, as we see in Romans 5, 6, to take our place. For when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Romans 4.25 tells us that he died because of our sins. Not only did he come uh, to take our place, but it was because of our sin that he had to do that. Also, he bore them on the cross. A most horrible uh, and treacherous, torturous way for a person to die. The, 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 the worst way that the Roman Empire could envision to punish somebody, uh, not only giving them this horrible painful situation uh, of exhaustion and thirst and, and uh, uh, the, the, the pain that went along with that, but also the humiliation of being hung up in the air for everybody to look at. That's what Christ did for us. And during that process, he became sin for us. Adding to that humiliation the fact that he had to be separated from his God, his, his, God, his Father, uh, while he bore the sins of man on the cross. But the good news is we get the choice to accept that sacrifice. Hebrews 12.25 says, See that you do not refuse him who speaks. For if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven. Don't fall for the false advertising. It's a half-truth. There might be some short-term benefit or gratification from so many of the things that Satan offers us, but in the end, we will be reeled in and suffer the uh, crisis, the tragedy of eternal damnation. We won't be pleasing to God. We'll affect ourselves and the lives of others. We, we need to make good decisions with regard to the things that we see that we know are wrong. Just as it says in Hebrews 12, 25, see that you do not refuse him who speaks. If you need help with, with sin that reigns in your life now, or if you've never taken the opportunity to have those sins washed away, then you have the opportunity to make that choice now and come to Jesus. Don't listen to the half-truths of Satan. Uh, listen to the voice of Jesus as we stand and sing.
Will you bow with me? Heavenly Father, we come to you now in prayer, knowing that you're the all-powerful God that hears everything. Lord, we thank you for the, the very sobering lesson that was presented by Brother Johnny from your word this morning. Lord, help us to identify, have the wisdom to know the temptations that we face and the strength to call upon you when we need help with those, facing those temptations. Lord, we thank you for everything that you give us in our lives, everything that you provide for us. May we always keep our eyes on you and focused on the goal of eternal life. Lord, as we go about our day today and through the rest of the week, may we have the strength to know the priorities in our lives. When we're faced with temptations to maybe uh, miss services or, or not speak to somebody about the word, Lord, may we have the strength to overcome those and do what we know is right. Lord, thank you again for all the many blessings and for sending your son to die on the cross. It's his name we pray. Amen.